Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Kevin Quigley. I'm the scholarly director of the McEachern Institute for Public Policy and Governance. Thanks so much for joining us today in what I'm sure is going to be an outstanding discussion about climate change adaptation. We would like to begin by acknowledging that we're in Mi'kmaq, the ancestral and ancestral territory of the Mi'kmaq people. We are all treaty people. Next week, our panel discussion is entitled A Key Determinant of Health, Meeting the Housing Needs of Older LGBTQ2S Canadians, featuring Liesl Gambold, Jacqueline Gahagan, Sean Harmon, and Ren Thomas. And you may be familiar with some of this work. It's been getting quite a bit of national profile, so we strongly encourage you to come. I'm sure it's going to be an outstanding talk about some new research on, on the question of housing needs for older LGBTQ2S Canadians. So please join us next week. Uh, same bat time, same bat channel. Um, thank you for coming uh, to the, uh, the panel today. We also want to welcome the, uh, the, those of us joining us by Facebook. And we'd like to also thank uh, MEOPAR for their sponsorship today. So MEOPAR is the Marine Environmental Observation Prediction Response Network. Uh, it's a group uh, essentially located on campus actually, but it's a national network that supports research uh, in, in marine environmental risk and we'll be featuring some of the outstanding work that's happened that's been supported from that network today. Uh, their mission is to better understand and predict marine hazards. So they have sponsored us today and we're grateful for that sponsorship. Uh, today's panel will be chaired by Blair Feltmate. Uh, Blair Feltmate is a professor at the School of Environment, Enterprise and Development and he's the head of the INTAC Centre on Climate Adaptation. His primary interest is to de-risk Canada relative to the impacts of climate change and extreme weather events. Weather events. The INTAC Centre, led by Blair, focuses on three key programs, home flood protection, infrastructure adaptation, and corporate specific adaptation programs. Please join me in welcoming Blair Feltmate. Well, uh, thank you very much, and I'm uh, certainly pleased to be here this afternoon. So welcome to the session, which will run from uh, 12 till uh, 1.30, which is entitled Resilience or Reluctance, Climate Change Policy in Canada. And as was mentioned, my name is Blair Feltman, and I'll chair the session for the next 90 minutes or so. As was also mentioned, if you'll allow me just to be fractionally redundant just for a moment, uh, the session is hosted then by the McKechn Institute and the, uh, for Pol Public Policy and Governance and MEOPAR. And on a regular basis, the Institute focuses on issues that are of substantial importance to Atlantic Canada and by extension the, the rest of Canada. And certainly climate change fits well within that, that category. Uh, climate change and extreme weather risks are uh, certainly in evidence in the Maritimes. For example, over the past few years, we see the increasingly costly toll that flooding, flooding uh, takes with communities and homeowners across New Brunswick, Nova Scotia and uh, PEI. And along with flooding, we have ice storms affecting electricity outages and shoreline impacts that are becoming more impactful over time. And I'm staying at the Lord Nelson Hotel, so I see the evidence of what wind can do to tall cranes and uh, blow them into buildings. And they're trying right now to get this crane out of the side of the building. It's impacted in there pretty hard. So uh, to help figure out how the Maritimes should best prepare for climate change and extreme weather risk, we have four uh, top flight speakers and authorities with us today. And starting on my left, and I'll introduce them and on my right, and I will introduce them in the order that they will present, uh, each for 10 minutes. And my uh, toughest job here today is keep them all to 10 minutes. Um, we have, starting on my immediate right, Dr. Omar uh, Schwinard. Omar is Professor Emeritus in Environment and Associate Professor at the uh, Master Program in Environmental Studies at the University of Moncton. And over the last 20 years, he has been active in participatory action research and community-based research to engage, engage coastal communities to face climate change issues, which we, he, he will uh, focus on today in his opening remarks. Next, because the talks are short, so I'm just going to introduce everybody all at once. We have uh, Dr. Kate uh, Sharon. Kate is uh, an applied social scientist in the School of Resource and Environmental Studies at uh, Dalhousie here. Uh, she studies how we see, use, experience, and value modified landscapes like farms, coasts, and hydroelectric dams, amongst other factors, um, and how in the face of climate change we can work collectively towards uh, a more sustainable and just future for um, places we live in and care about. And she will address these subjects uh, uh, immediately following Omar. Then uh, if we go over by uh, three, at least relative to my right, 
We have Megan Leslie, who's probably well known to many of you. Uh, Megan began as head of the World Wildlife Fund in Canada in uh, 2017, and since she's come into that role, I spend a fair bit of time in their office now working on uh, projects uh, we're planning jointly. Before joining the World Wildlife Fund, Megan was a member of parliament representing Halifax for two terms during which she was uh, deputy leader of the official opposition, environment critic, and vice chair of the government committee on environment and sustainable development. Um, amongst the many points that she'll focus on today, uh, Megan will uh, address how efforts to retain natural infrastructure and biodiversity function to sequester greenhouse gas emissions and limit uh, current and future flood risk. And then finally, and certainly not to, to the least, but to my extreme right, we have uh, Dr. Uh, Robert Strang. Robert is the Chief uh, Medical Officer of Health in Nova Scotia, appointed in August of uh, 2007. Uh, as Chief Medical Officer, he has provided leadership around the renewal of public health system in Nova Scotia, as well as raising awareness about, uh, around the importance of creating policies and environments that support better health for uh, Nova Scotian families and communities. And today, Rob will address the human health implications of global warming and the need to better prepare for extreme weather events. And for sure, he will be engaging. We were just talking upstairs a little bit about the extreme heat that's coming towards this country and our need to uh, prepare for extreme heat. Um, following each of the presentations, so 10 minutes each, uh, uh, we'll, we have uh, sort of predefined students here who are going to hit them with ultra hard questions that are going to challenge them all. Uh, three or four graduate students, then we'll turn it up to, uh, over to the audience. So let's uh, start. I'll turn it over to Omar. Welcome. Thank you very much for the invitation here. Did you hear me correctly? Yeah. Uh, and uh, just to uh, show you the, the map the, where the, this uh, work is coming from, we, have, we collaborate in the Gulf of St. Lawrence. And uh, especially, you know, we, uh, the, uh, what we will mention here, it was more what they call the Acadian coast, you know, from here to here. But it was a collaboration with the uh, University of Quebec at Rimouski. And uh, I will pass very fast, you know, the, the, the beginning because it's all, uh, it's all uh, a photo, you know, from a different uh, a time, you know, that we, uh, we took in uh, New Brunswick and Quebec. And uh, just to come to the focus, it's a participatory research, you know, and, uh, uh, and um, it's a, just the context, you know, that uh, Quebec has a proactive climate change stance, but more cent uh, centered on mitigation than adaptation. New Brunswick has a climate change uh, policy since 2002, but still uh, is not in an enforceable uh, legislation. In most province, adaptation must fall on the shoulder of our local government, not federal or province. And, uh, just here, it's the, the researcher because it was a collaborative research, not only with the community, but also uh, through, uh, with a different researcher from uh, university. And uh, uh, just, you know, to say that the uh, participatory research, it's not very welcome, you know, uh, for the finance, uh, uh, public finance or because generally this is what, uh, what you're doing, is it serious or no? And we have to justify that very closely. And uh, it's a research with people, not on people. We have to negotiate our entry, you know, with the people. And the co-construct of knowledge and, and adaptation plan, and a researcher or partner, not either leader or uh, not a cons consultant, and uh, community development, community-based adaptation, and uh, uh, it's a grounded theory, the analyze, it's mean that we build the research, you know, with the, the, the analyze, you know, um, with the uh, information that we gather. And methodology, you know, it's uh, generally what we use, you know, in the, um, in social sciences, in qualitative one, it's a questionnaire, semi-directive semi interview, focus group, kitchen assembly, participative observation, public present presentation, and uh, tools at participative mapping, 
when we don't have tools at the beginning, we use a large map, you know, in the room, and we split the, the group together. Where it's, what's the problem in your area? You know, it's the way that we start with them. And um, uh, uh, project timeline varies, a negotiated term, term of reference of the project with the community, including concern of the community, uh, the desired outcome, the timetable. That's very important here because we told to the people, you know, that with the finance that we have, we have, we don't have too much time, but it's very important that at the beginning we have to be clear. Establish a diagnosis of the present situation through questionnaire interview participation, participate observation, biographical uh, review, data analysis, cartography, and uh, engaging on open and dialogue around the implication of climate change and adaptation with community. That's very important at the beginning to say that we just not here to look at one aspect. We look at the overall aspect. And uh, sometimes it's not easy because they want to focus on their problem and their local problem. And uh, this is uh, a uh, colleague from uh, Rimouski that uh, this table, it's, uh, we start with, start with the issue, understanding the risk, uh, and def defying, identifying physical consequence, socioeconomic consequence, identifying uh, governance and policy consequence, integration, and this, the part of here is very important. And uh, when you arrive to pr prioritize what's, what's, what's uh, we cannot do all, we have to choose. And after that action, and you can see here, you have vulnerable and you have resilient and, uh, and monitoring, adjusting. And after that, we start with other issues when we continue if we're other finance with the community. And uh, advantage. It's locally adapted, it's a solution, ability to think outside of the box, better acceptability and uh, co-option because on deliberative progress, process, appropriation of knowledge and tools, better understanding and preparedness, more able to negotiate with government. That's important to do it that at the end you will be, it's the tool at the end that you have to negotiate with to with, uh, with uh, government now. And uh, uh, strengthening community cohesion, contribution to community development. And here it's uh, one of the, it was Pointe du Chien, it's near Chediac, close to Moncton, maybe 25 kilometers from Moncton. It was a, 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 um, a bridge that it was inundation in 2000, in the uh, big storm in January, big storm in October two in the first year, you know, that, that's a major, major storm. And, uh, but the people want to do a, a wall, and we agree at the end that if we want to evacuate, it's need a good bridge that we have to elevate the, the, the level. And uh, the, another place, it's Beaubassin, that's very interesting. It was, I think, for the Atlantic, the first time that uh, it was um, the, the rural community there. The, uh, they have a bylaw that they include the further civil uh, sea level rise that we have not, you have not to build, you know, in this area. And we have to, and it was very interesting at that time. And uh, in the north of the province, in the uh, peninsula, Acadian Peninsula, in introduction of noble dig zone, uh, the, the, the same place, and uh, 30 meters from any fresh out salt water body. And the government's tour, a tool, and that's very important, you know, because a lot of this community have no government. It was um, LSD government, local district service, and we work with them, you know, that they have to create a local body, elect a local body to establish law. But it was not you know, out for all the territory, just cocaine that uh, accept that. And uh, here it's, uh, it was that before that you do anything, because a very good firm, engineering firm in North New Brunswick, told, have a, a study, and they says, 
if you, you they ask for a wall, and he says, yes, we'll build a wall. But at the page five, on eight character, character, character at the end of the, of the page, it says, but the wall will not um, stop you know, the water to come by the extremity. And, but the people don't saw that. He says, the, the engineer told us that we need a wall, you know. And um, it's, uh, it's, you know, to, to do a good reading, you know, of the report, it's important to with, us, to, with the, with the, with the um, people. And uh, here, just a, a resume of what's happened. How many minutes now? Two more minutes. Two more, yeah. In the, What's happened, you know, it, in the batteries area, it's evaluation of the risk su submersion, mitigation measure against sea level rise, restriction, restriction development in zone risk, and education of the people. Here we passed two years, passed two years, and uh, they refused at the end the conclusion. But after that, four years after, they start, you know, to come. And he says, we, yes, we need to pass to the action. But sometimes it's long, you know. Uh, Le Goulet and LIDAR measurement, you, know, you cannot do anything if you, you don't have a good, uh, a good uh, measurement. And in Cocal Grandig, we pass the three uh, aspects, you know, protection, accommodation, and retreat, you know, with, with them. And here it's uh, important here because we did uh, uh, website, you know, that you could, you could consult. It's, uh, it's on both language, French and English, except that the Bay of Fundy is just in English. It's not in French. But uh, in the Acadian coastline, it's uh, in the both language because we are not enough study. Okay. And uh, that's uh, uh, the resume of the, uh, the, the work that we did. And at the end, we, what we like, uh, uh, a leg what, uh, that we dig to the, to the community, we let something like that, that we build together, you know. Uh, and the challenge, need for, uh, to be a will to engage and adapt, and uh, slow process, uh, conflict and tester interest, sometimes it's not easy, mobilization of entire co community, it's not, and uh, to, to, to work with the pre-consumption, it's not evident to role of the government, of the Indian agency, because the, the, the local government has to be strong in this situation. Challenge and limitation, we have to go by with the science, told us, to pass to the action. And science, natural dynamic, social dynamic, and action, social, ecological system, it's entire. That's okay, thank you. And that's the guys, that's with me. me I'm here, the guys who was there, that it was the first to establish that we have to, we need to withdraw. And uh, it was my old student at that moment. <laughs> Thank you for that. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation to come do this. Thanks for the introduction. Thanks for the opening remarks. Uh, I don't know if I'm going to need my glasses. I haven't made the step to um, uh, bifocals yet, so I might be looking at you over it, which always frightens my students, I'm sorry. I'm interested in how people perceive and experience landscape change, particularly landscape changes done in the name of sustainability. I've been asking myself a question for the past few years, maybe a provocative one. Why should the landscape arrangements that we have today get a privileged position in our decision-making about the future? To put it another way, how can we make the scale of changes necessary in our livelihoods and our lifestyles if we refuse to allow our everyday landscapes to be transformed? For a few years, I've been developing an idea I've been calling climax thinking. Citizens, myself included, acting as if their current landscape had reached some sort of apex, even an intended state, and one that deserves to persist irrespective of changing environmental conditions and societal needs. I've been calling it climax because this thinking seems to me to echo the theory of succession in plant ecology, where plant communities predictably replace one another in, in mature, um, until a mature, fated climax plant community takes hold. 
in ecology, they've realized that there is no one climax for a given state, that multiple stable states can exist. In our lived landscapes, we haven't really made that same realization. Case in point, I stood last month on the former dike lands at the mouth of the Halfway River up near Hansport. That river has had an abateau at its mouth for over a century. For those unfamiliar with an abateau, it's a, it's a one-way gate that opens to let fresh water drain out at low tide, but, but prevents seawater from coming in at high tide. In the two years since this abateau suddenly failed, there's been a remarkable amount of spontaneous salt marsh recovery. But last winter, the citizens of Hansport turned out by the hundreds at meetings and marches to demand the abateau's replacement at great expense, although the dike land is now owned by the province and it's not being farmed. The abateau has now been replaced, but is already failing. Holding that line will only get harder in the years to come. By trying to hold our own landscape in stasis, we often pass the impacts and costs of our decisions, for instance, rejecting salt marsh restoration or managed retreat, onto others in other places. The classic example, a very small scale, is when a seawall starves neighbors of sediment and causes their shoreline to erode more quickly. Empathy seems at such times to fail us. This summer, my master's student, Krista Sutton, I don't know if she's here, no. Oh. <laughs> she and I ran 14 focus groups with coastal residents around Nova Scotia. All the focus groups described the challenges facing the coasts and discussed some of the nature-based options for coping, including living shorelines and managed retreat. Maybe Megan's gonna to speak to some of that kind of natural infrastructure. But some of the focus groups tested different ways of framing the need for change to see if any influenced how citizens perceived that need. I'll give you the bad news first. It appears that climax thinking comes from exceptionalism. The sense that rules that apply to others don't apply to us. And this includes, apparently, the dynamics of the coast. Specifically, resistance to change was connected to a strong self-orientation rather than just ignorance of the issues and options. The latter is not a surprise. The knowledge deficit approach to behavioral change has long been debunked in social science. But it is bad news because values are harder to change, harder to change than knowledge. Exceptionalism means we tend to think we should receive special consideration when difficult decisions are being made. We heard things like, well, it might work over there, but it wouldn't work here, or, you know, this house has been here for such a long time and it's a really important part of the community and its history. A psychological concept called solution aversion tells us that the lack of risk perceptions among some coastal residents may in fact be caused by what they see as, as unacceptable ways to address it. They reject the problem along with the solution. The good news from the focus groups is that it's becoming clear as we analyze the discussions and the pre and post surveys that two of the framing devices we, ha we tested helped people to see change as urgent, if uncomfortable. Firstly, it helps students to think about their duty to put things in place now so future generations could also safely enjoy the coast. Secondly, it helps citizens to remember the way that their community has worked together at challenging times including big things like wartime mobilization or smaller ones like illnesses. This latter framing around the meaning that can come with sacrifice reminds me of the work of American writer Rebecca Solnit. She wrote about communities after disaster in the 2009 book, A Paradise Built in Hell. She thinks that people have an unmet need for altruism and that's why it quickly emerges when choice is removed such as in a disaster situation. Moreover, she notes that people in post-disaster situations are surprisingly enriched rather than impoverished. They unexpectedly feel joy as they meet otherwise neglected desires for public life and civil society, for inclusion, purpose, and power. I'm quoting her there. She included post Juan Halifax as a case study in her book, so we know that we have the capacity for this too. But can such altruistic and public good thinking be mobilized in the absence of disaster? It's a big question. A recent case study may provide some insight here. I recently led the writing of a chapter in an OECD report that presented a dike realignment project in Truro as Canada's case study of coping with rising seas. 
Dike realignment usually involves making straighter and higher sections of dike further back from the original line and restoring salt marsh on the foreground for protection. That case study has two possible lessons I see for this discussion. The first lesson is that we may be expecting people to think and empathize at scales that we're simply not capable of. The Truro case fell under a provincial policy that sees all owners of land behind dikes as members of a marsh body organization. In Acadian times, this made sense. Those individuals had a shared responsibility, helping to build and maintain the dikes, um, levying fees to remake roads or um, uh, new, new abateau. Even though the Department of Agriculture today holds responsibility over the dikes, the somewhat archaic governance structure remains. So the department had to engage with the landowners in Truro, explain the issues, and ask them to vote in favor of a realignment design that included some restoration of former dike land back to Salt Marsh. Now, this one was a relatively easy call for the landowners. No homes were affected, and the government had already bought the land in question. The marsh body was inactive, though, so they first activated it basically telling landowners that they had a shared interest and duty. Once activated, the small group was empowered with the same rights, really, as a small municipality to decide their fate. This was a high-stakes consultation. They could vote no. But after a few meetings and discussions and various evidence and this deliberative process, the Marsh body deliberated and voted unanimously for an option which has essentially managed coastal retreat. It makes me wonder if this marsh body governance model can be used elsewhere on our coast to re-engineer a finer grained sense of mutual responsibility. And Professor Chouinard's um, work certainly suggests that it can. The second lesson is that a lack of coastal policy doesn't have to mean a lack of coastal adaptation. That Truro project did not happen as a result of coastal protection legislation or adaptation regulations. It came about through what my postdoc, postdoc Tuhid Rahman has told me is called institutional entrepreneurship. Motivated individuals seeing novel opportunities with the policy instruments that do exist. The Nova Scotia Department of Environment's Climate Change Unit representation here um, has worked as a facilitator on climate adaptation since EGSPA. Its grassroots training approach was midwife to a plan that transportation and infrastructure renewal cooked up with agriculture. That plan allowed them to hit a few key goals for the departments, wetland credits, reducing infrastructure costs, while reducing flood and climate risk for Truro, all in the absence of explicit coastal policy. I'm delighted we are now on the way to coastal protection regu regulations, but we do need more eggs in our basket. Problems of such complexity benefit from a diversity of aligned policy instruments and innovation with the ones we do have. All of the choices left are hard ones, I'm afraid. As I often tell my students, all the easy decisions have been made, and because we thought they were easy at the time, we maybe didn't think about them hard enough. If we want political will for the difficult ones ahead, we need public will. And that will require us to work with empathy. Empathy for all the other things people deal with on a day-to-day -day basis in this province that can trump climate in their minds. Yes, empathy for the connection that citizens feel to their coastal landscapes. And of course, empathy for our limited cognitive software. But only by working with empathy will we be able to build a new way of being coastal in the face of climax thinking. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, thank, thank, uh, thank you for the opportunity to be part of this, uh, this panel. Uh, very exciting, and it's time, and it's kind of exciting, and I'm going to go a bit of a tangent, just to be in an election where climate change is actually right at the top of the agenda of the policy conversation, so maybe things are changing. So, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, climate change and the impacts on human health with a particular focus on the need for emergency preparedness and response. If you look up here, I mean, it, it, it's, it's under-acknowledged, I would, I would argue, that the impact on climate change uh, on health. And this is not something for the future. This is happening right now uh, in Canada and around the globe. 
significantly growing body of literature about the impacts on air pollution as a huge contributor to, uh, to respiratory and cardiovascular illness. Uh, we know that with changes in, uh, in climate, we have changes in the increase in, in, uh, in vector ecology. So we have uh, increased risks around mosquito-borne diseases, increased risks around tick-borne diseases just in, in North America. Increased, uh, because of climate change, increased allergens and what that does around respiratory illness and asthma. There's some substantive issues around the impacts on, on both on water quality and water quantity. Uh, and we know that some of the global conflicts are already happening, are driven by, by, uh, by shrinking re access to, uh, to, to water. The, uh, and tied in with that, we, with global conflicts, et cetera, we have more and more mass dislocations of populations and what that does um, uh, on, on, at a mass scale around, around uh, health. Tied in with all of this, there's a growing body of evidence around the impacts on mental health from both, the, uh, both responding to this and also the, the anxiety and stress about this perhaps happening. And lastly, I'm going to focus on this piece, especially with the, with the climate change, the growing risks of more frequent, more severe storms, uh, increased heat and cold events. Uh, all of those have impacts upon our health. Who's, who's controlling the slides here? I am. <laughs> There we go. So in Canada, we're, and again, I want to emphasize this, we under-recognize this and we're already seeing impacts. Uh, more extreme heat and cold events. Uh, I think heat is the biggest issue, but I was a bit, I was taken a bit uh, back last year when we, when we had more, last two winters, even in Halifax, where we've had more uh, periods of, of prolonged cold to learn that that was actually because of the disruption of polar winds, et cetera, by climate change and pushing polar air further south. So it's not just heat, it's also the potential for extreme colds. Certainly we know just recently with Dorian, the risk, the chance, we're gonna have more frequent, more severe storms. And if those are associated with, with increased, uh, increased high tides and, and coastal erosion, et cetera, the impacts of storm surges. Fortunately, we haven't had in Nova Scotia yet a major issue around forest fires. But if you look across Canada, the last two summers have had the worst forest fire seasons we've ever had uh, in, in out in Western Canada. All of this requires, uh, uh, as we, if we talk about climate change adaptations, means that we have to pay particular attention to having robust and I call comprehensive emergency preparedness and cross-sectoral planning and response. And there's a couple of issues there that we have to pay particular attention to. No fault of people involved, but the, 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 the tendency in emergency preparedness has been around response, kind of break glass in time of emergency. We have to have a much more comprehensive uh, piece of that because our response is really only as good as how much we've invested in planning. And when we come to things like adapting to, uh, I'll talk, you know, heat and building heat uh, response plans at a community level, that's a multi-sectoral response. So the planning and the thinking has to be multi-sectoral, engaging all parts of communities at all different levels. It's not just relying on our emergency first responders who are gonna pick up the pieces when something happens. It's much more complex than that. And I think one, certainly my, I've been in this work for more than a decade. We have made substantive progress uh, in Nova Scotia on this. I look and I've, I've said this at various meetings in our response to Dorian was a much better response in previous events than we've had. Each time we learn, and we are building much more of this comprehensive approach and much better integration We're led by the Emergency Measures Organization, bringing Nova Scotia power and the te telephone to the table, all those kind of pieces that, that are part of this. And so hopefully we'll, you know, and, and the, our, our Nova Scotia power had really responded and their ability to respond to Dorian was far better than previous storms. But in Doran, we've learned we have an issue on telecommunications. So that's the next piece we have to work together on. How do we make sure that, our, our, that we're a society that's relying on, on telecommunications? And how do we make sure that is more, uh, less vulnerable uh, in these types of events? So what are we doing here in Nova Scotia? Um, certainly, I'm involved with some of the, uh, and my colleague Jim McDougall there, Jim, put up your hand here, uh, from uh, Health System Emergency Management. We've had a dedicated team for a decade or more really within the health system, really pushing the need for the health system to have a much better emergency response capacity. And we're developing that. 
our, our current, uh, but, but a lot of that has been built on things that happen within the health system, whether it's a pandemic or whether it's a, uh, uh, um, a, a, a hospital going down because of a power outage or something, or a fire in a hospital. But we're now involved in a couple of key projects. They're small, but I think they're, gonna, they're in the right direction. With some federal funding from uh, Environment Climate Change Canada, we now are developing a heat alert response system. So we have, we're working at a provincial level, as well as with a, with, as a pilot project, the, the Queen, or sorry, Kings County has five municipalities, all who have uh, worked together and they have hired a single municipal emergency uh, uh, planner for that. So we're working with that Kings County. The whole point is, so, so if we expect more heat related events, what do we actually have to build at a provincial level so we can coordinate it across government departments and coordinate with things like Nova Scotia Power, et cetera, but most importantly at a local community level. So how do we respond? And we have to look at uh, in a, a number of key areas. One of them is, is important communication that we have to make sure that communities are well aware of the likelihood, increased likelihood of heat events, and how do we have good communication before and during events. There's a lot of number of things we need to to do what I call kind of a behavior change. So how do we actually as individuals and communities change what we do, whether it's shifting work hours, whether it's shifting the time or canceling sport and recreation events, all those things that we decrease people's uh, being exposed to extreme heat. Uh, but those are, those are more, uh, more minor. They're sort of substantive structural things that we need to do. How do we build our communities, especially our urban environment in Halifax, Urban cities are more vulnerable to heat simply because we have a lot of concrete and asphalt. We have large, I just learned from Blair Feltmate, we have large uh, high rises which are vulnerable as if you lose, uh, because if you have extreme heat, there's also a risk of loss of power. So think of what happens to people when you have extreme heat event, prolonged heat events and you have no longer have power. So you have no air conditioning, no elevators, and you have isolated seniors that you need to try to get out, all those kind of pieces. But along with that, how do we actually have lots of air conditioned environments? So as long as we have power or generators, how do we actually use all these air conditioned environments, many of which are in the private sector, but how do we work to create cooling centers, uh, all those kind of pieces so we can actually bring people if necessary to areas which are cool and protect, protect their health. So that means, so there are, but there are, uh, it's important we know who is most vulnerable to heat. So it's young people and the elderly. So one of the key things we have to do as we develop our, our, our heat alert response plan is that where do we know who are the isolated vulnerable seniors in our community? They're the most vulnerable from uh, health impacts, uh, if, uh, mobility and, and even dying from heat. So how, do we know where they are and how do we access them? How do we either bring things to them like water and, 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 and fans and things like that or actually get them and evacuate them, bring them to a cooling centers? All those require a lot of coordination between emergency services, a whole bunch of social services, the health sector. Uh, and then the last piece on that is we have, to, we have to look at equity. Who are the most vulnerable from an equity perspective? And we know that in, in heat events, some of the most vulnerable are people who are homeless. So also, how do we make sure that those who are most marginalized and vulnerable and with an equity lens are, are, are part of our planning? The other piece we're doing is around the Climate, climate Adaptation Leadership Program. Again, federal funding. So what we're doing with that is we're actually surveying all our, long, all our um, hospital facilities, and, but most especially our long-term care facilities. Our belief is that many of our long-term care facilities, continuing care, residential homes, they are not prepared for a prolonged heat events and their resident population is very vulnerable. So we need to understand their current state and then how do we build on that state. And while both of these initiatives are focused on heat, many of the principles we're doing will apply to a broad range of other health impacts. So if we get extreme cold, it's the same. Who's vulnerable that we need to get to a warming center? Uh, if we have prolonged power outages, again, who's vulnerable that we need to get into to a shelter? And the last piece is, which is, uh, is I come back to the, 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 um, the connection and the cross-sectoral planning. I firmly believe that one of the biggest outcomes out of this work, we have already strengthening our relation between the health system uh, both the healthcare side and the public health side that I'm in and the emergency measure system so we have a much more of a coordinated approach moving forward to a whole range of, of weather related events. Thank you. Hi, so adaptation, adaptation, we got to get ready. 
uh, emergency preparedness, we need flood resistant infrastructure, but what about mitigation? Is it too late? Is the train uh, barreling towards us and we can't do anything? I think we can do things. There are policies out there. It's going to take a lot of things. It's going to take a price on carbon. It's going to take energy efficiency. It's going to take renewables. And I'm going to talk to you a little bit about how we can also use nature to fight climate change. Uh, so as you heard, my name is Megan Leslie, and I'm uh, President and CEO of WWF Canada. So the World Wildlife Fund Canada, we are a wildlife conservation organization. Our mission is to create a future where nature and people thrive, partly because we understand that people are a part of nature, but also because we know if we're going to have conservation wins that truly last, uh, we need to make sure that people are a part, they see themselves in that conservation work. And as a wildlife conservation organization, our primary concern is really wildlife and their habitats, making sure that they have space where they can thrive. And we're focused on biodiversity, which is really uh, about the variety of life in an ecosystem. So you've heard from the other presenters today, and we all know we are in a climate crisis. But I have bad news for us all. We are also in a biodiversity crisis. These are twin crises. They are happening at the same time, and we are in it. So in 2017, WWF Canada, we wrote something called Living Planet Report Canada. And what we did was we took all this data that was available on, on vertebrates in Canada. And we thought, well, how are wildlife doing in Canada? Are they on the rise? Are their populations stable? And so we thought, you know, we're probably not going to see what's happening around the world where wildlife populations are on steep decline, because it's Canada. We've got all this space, all this land, all this seascape and ice scape. Well, we took the data that we had and we realized that wildlife loss is not, uh, it is indeed a Canadian problem. It is a problem here in Canada. And this report actually showed how bad things are. So 50%, half of our species in Canada are on the decline. That means they're not growing, they're not stable, but they're on the decline. So the next question is, of course, well, if they're in decline, to what degree? Is it, is it steep? Is it relatively stable? 83%. That, those wildlife populations are on the decline to the tune of 83%. So it is really happening. We are facing a biodiversity crisis in this country. And what is causing it? Habitat loss, habitat disruption, habitat fragmentation. So why am I talking about biodiversity loss at a climate panel? Well, globally, a third of our global emissions of greenhouse gases come from the destruction of nature. We are destroying forests to build farms. We are destroying eel grass and wetlands because we want a condo with a nice view. We are destroying peat bogs to get to those precious minerals that are underneath. And for every forest we cut down and every wetland that we drain, we are releasing that carbon that is stored in that landscape and it's going up into the atmosphere. So remember, a third of global emissions are actually coming from the destruction of nature. And that is staggering. So as a wildlife organization, we want to protect those areas where we know carbon is locked in the soil. So we mapped out Canada and we said, where is the carbon locked in the soil? Where do we know carbon is stored in forests? And we've been able to create this map to see where the carbon is in Canada that we want to protect so that those GHGs don't unwittingly end up in the atmosphere. The vast majority of Canada's carbon rich habitats, those forests and wetlands and soils that are storing significant amounts of carbon and preventing increased warming associated with climate change, well, the majority of them have not been protected. We're not saying we need to keep this carbon in the ground. 77% of habitats with high densities of soil carbon are inadequately or not at all protected. 75% of of uh, habitats with high densities of forest biomass are inadequately or not at all protected. So to put simply, we've not been thinking about these carbon landscapes when we've been trying to protect land. Now, those wetlands and those forests, they store carbon, but they are also habitat. So we, what we did was we took our analysis one step further and we laid out where are the species at risk in Canada? And we are able to map that out and then actually overlay it with where the carbon is stored so that we could identify high priority areas for protection. 
These are areas where we can work to address that dual crises of climate change and habitat loss. Working in these areas, we're going to be able to get the biggest bang for our buck, because we can't be everywhere, and it's triage time. Some of Canada's least protected areas are the most important for at-risk species, for climate adaptation, and for carbon storage. You notice on this map, St. John Watershed is one of the areas. Here in the Maritimes, this area um, has high amounts of carbon and also a high number of species at risk, and we're working there. At, oh, this is, I didn't know that was in there. This is a great slide. <laughs> Look, it looks like lungs, right? It looks like capillaries around the lungs. This is a breathing space. 55,000 square kilometers, this is the largest watershed between the Mississippi and the St. Lawrence. It's home to over 500,000 people, along with many rare and endangered species and habitats. Everything from the Atlantic salmon to wood turtles to short-nosed sturgeon and a plant called the tall, hairy groove burr. We gotta save that sucker. Uh, I don't know what it does, but it, I mean with a name like that. So this map of Wolostok, also uh, known as the St. John River, shows you that it's home not just to an array of endangered species, but it's home to people and their towns and their villages and their farms. And for a long time, humans have been altering this landscape. We've been putting in parking lots and channels and seawalls and farms and towns. And as you've heard, we all know that with climate change comes increased flooding and it means uh, maybe less precipitation falling, but falling all at once in these big weather events. It also means more frequent winter thaws and an increased risk of ice jams, which leads to flooding. Ice jams are a natural phenomenon, especially on the St. John River. They happen every spring. But last year, the St. John River had an ice jam in December. This is Wolostok, the St. John River, um, about a 60 kilometer stretch below Fredericton. And uh, this is a shot from NASA, what it looks like from space. Remember all those towns and rivers, uh, towns and uh, villages along the river? They are underwater. It doesn't take much, and they are underwater. The St. John River faced five major climate-related events over the past five years and over $200 million in damages. In the past two years, its flooding has impacted over 12,000 properties and cost over $100 million in the past two years in New Brunswick. It would have been much worse if there had been an ice jam because when there's ice jams, it can lead to water in places that you don't even imagine. It's not predictable. It's a massive problem and it requires cooperation between all those towns and villages and a, a variety of actors. And so this is one of the places that we are working with communities to get the ball rolling on this idea of climate adaptation and resilience. So, you know, people are coping. Coping being the key word. They're making sure their houses are raised up off the ground. They're fortifying their foundations. But we don't want people to have to cope. We want to see lasting change. We want to see transformation. Because we can build all the flood barriers we want, but concrete absorbs a lot less water than nature. Um, I heard a great stat. Peter Dunker, I'm glad you're here as a tree expert. Is this stat accurate that a silver maple can absorb 220 gallon, uh, liters of water a day? Does that sound plausible? That's bananas, thank you, because I was like, that can't be true. It's true, we have an expert in our midst. <laughs> that is bananas. That is a lot more than a culvert. So, but here's the thing, while grass and trees and plants absorb way more water than concrete, it also helps us deal with flooding. It also uh, actually pulls carbon out of the air and puts it into the landscape, and it is also habitat if we do it right. It is habitat for those species at risk in Wolostok in the St. John River. Wetlands can be like buffers on the edge of rivers, and if managed in a way that allows the river to expand and contract without degrading its ecological functioning, it would be such a resilient solution. By focusing on green infrastructure, we can help ensure that those communities are more resilient, that they are resilient into the future, and we can also bring back that habitat so that wildlife can thrive. Our goal is to help these communities move from vulnerability to resiliency by restoring the river's ability to cope and respond, like planting trees and stabilizing those banks to ensure that it can handle climate-related um, flooding events and, and increased water flows. 
the key to understanding and making progress on climate change, it's complex. The, the solutions are going to be complex. Their implementation is going to be complex. Um, but by working together with communities and focusing on green infrastructure, we can build a future where nature and people thrive. Thank you. So um, obviously four excellent presentations. Now what we're gonna do is briefly, we're gonna turn to uh, four graduate students who will self-identify here in a second. They're going to direct questions to each of the uh, presenters. Uh, the presenters will provide concise answers to those questions and then we open it to the floor for questions. So um, first student I have is uh, Sarah De La Cruz, which uh, where is? Oh, I, I don't actually know what they all look like. Yet. <laughs> Go ahead. So my question is for Megan Leslie. Um, first of all, thank you for uh, coming here today and sharing your knowledge. Um, so 91% of Canada's greenhouse gas emissions come from BC, Alberta, Saskatchewan, uh, Ontario, and Quebec. Yet it is coastal communities, specifically here in Atlantic Canada, that suffer as a result of these emissions. Um, and assuming that you still stand by the Climate Change Accountability Act, and uh, as a refresher for everybody, she has re reintroduced this uh, bill in June 2011 in the Parliament. And uh, so assuming that you still stand by that bill and considering that Canada now has the pan-Canadian framework on clean growth and climate change, are there any changes would you like to see proposed to the Climate Change Accountability Act and what are the accountability measures that would be most beneficial to the Atlantic provinces? Oh, Sarah. <laughs> I still stand behind it, but I've got like limited space in my hard drive. And so now that I'm in nature, I have forgotten a lot about parliament. Uh, could be post-trauma, I don't know. Uh, <laughs> But here's the thing, so my memory of this piece of legislation uh, is that it doesn't force solutions on provinces, and I think that's key. What it says is Canada as a country, we have to keep our emissions uh, below a certain amount. And the beauty of that, that con the way of writing a piece of legislation like that, it acknowledges that we are a federal country, a federalist country, and that provinces have powers and they have authority over um, their local jurisdictions. And that way we can ensure that whatever we're doing on the ground meets Nova Scotia's needs. So if there is a price on carbon, where do those revenues go in Nova Scotia? Can we ensure they're going to actually supercharge uh, that the um, work that's already happening? Can we, like we are actually a North American leader in energy, energy efficiency in this province. That's, been, that's wonderful. So are, can we invest more in there? Can we do these local solutions that Omer was talking about, locally adopted solutions? So the, the trick is ensuring um, that as a province, we're ready to do the things that are uh, the best for us as a province, which I think, in fact, is the name of the panel. Resilience or reluctance. So what are we doing as a province? Are we being resilient? Are we being reluctant? Yeah. It's, right. Give your name first. Yeah, I'm Colleen Keenan. I'm a MPA student as well. I actually have a question for you again. I'm tapping into your parliamentary sort of side of things again. Um, so according to the UN, there's about 70 million displaced peoples. Um, but under that, there's no such thing as a climate refugee. It's only recognized as people who had to leave their homes because of um, war, famine, things like that. Um, I'm curious what you think will change come in the coming years with climate change, and will there be a uh, definition for these people who are forced to leave their houses and homes because of climate and what's Canada's role in that? I am going to throw it back to you because you know about this and I don't. What's what's happening when uh, out there in the world when people are talking about climate climate refugee status? Our country saying this is a real thing. I'm not up on the policy discussion. Yeah, so I, what I've done research on is especially in this, I mean, this past September with in Bermuda there were um, people trying to come to the United States and then they were barred from coming in as a last minute policy change. Mm -hmm. Um, usually um, people from the Bahamas can enter with a police report and their passport, but then all of a sudden oh, overnight right. there was a change saying you're not allowed in anymore, no right. real explanation. So it's this, it's this fallback on quick policy that doesn't really have a definition yeah. yet. 
Well, my heart, and this is just a heart answer, my heart says that uh, mm -hmm. if we are a country, a country that receives refugees warmly, um, then why wouldn't we also receive climate refugees? Uh, that is a, a position not based in any policy discussion that I know of, but just my heart says that. Um, Robert, I don't know if you have experience with that on the health front. Not, uh, not specifically, but the question that I have in my mind, not to dismiss your point at all, but I think we need to think about internal climate, if you want to call them refugees. How many people were dislocated from Fort McMurray for extended period of time? And that's going to become more and more frequent. Uh, and so what are we going to do? What, what, what do we call them refugees or whatever? People who are di di already here in Canada are dislocated from their homes for perhaps for extended period of time. We need to think about that as well. Next. Um, hi, my question's for Dr. Sharon. You give your name first. Oh, Zach. Yeah, Thorne. Uh, <laughs> research has emphasized the need for a, a collaborative approach at climate change and mitigation, from our governments working to decarbonize our energy systems to our individual efforts to improve the energy efficiency of our homes and limit our consumption of single-use plastics. Does the same approach apply to adaptation, and in which ways can we improve our resiliency to the threats of climate change as individuals? a good question. Um, I think what I was speaking about in my statement was about some of our individual kind of fallacious thinking, I think, that can put us in a bit of a bubble, make us feel that it's actually somebody else's problem first, always, to make a change, whether it's a change towards mitigation or it's a change towards adaptation. Um, but of course, it, it can't be that. <clears throat> it can't always be just about us. And I think a lot of what we're seeing on the coast um, one of the examples I didn't bring up in my talk, but this provides me a good opportunity to do so, is sort of the way that sort of many citizens have rejected um, the need for flood mapping in communities. This is a really interesting one because it's current owners of homes don't want flood mapping, right? Because they don't want it to affect their resale value. Um, but that simply pushes the impact of that poor decision or that vulnerable moment onto the next person to buy that house and that next person. And so I feel like it's, it's the bubble itself, that thinking about the individual is actually part of the problem here. Yes, we have to take responsibility, but we have to take, we also have to kind of build a little bit of that mutual um, kind of duty and duty to future generations, other neighbors, people, and, and generate some sense of responsibility in that way. And I think that collective action is really, really important. Um, the steps to doing that, I mean, uh, are I think some of that, that granularity, uh, making it a little bit smaller. It's hard to think about HRM. I find it hard to think about the Halifax Region and the municipality with all the variety that it encompasses, for instance. But smaller areas might be a lot easier for people to think about in terms of uh, duty, uh, responsibility, action, empathy, et cetera. And so um, th that allowed me to talk about something I didn't have time to talk about earlier, but I'm not sure if it answered your question as much as you would like. Okay. Maybe, maybe Omar, you could add um, onto that. So no, I, am, I agree with her. Okay. <laughs> well, that's, that's an addition. Uh, and I think we have one more student. That's it. Okay. So now what we'll do is um, um, open it up to the audience. So don't uh, be shy. Raise your hands and raise your hand, like ri raise it. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Thank you very much for the talks. Um, my question is, based on your experience, what criteria should and has in the past determine competing priorities for adaptation options? So what should determine versus what has determined what actually gets done between competing adaptation options? We would like to pass that to Blair Feltmate, who's an expert in this area. Well, I don't, I don't know about the expert part, <laughs> but, but the, in reference to uh, focus on adaptation for Canada, by far and away, the, the, the attention is on flooding. Flooding is the most expensive cost to Canada, by far, relative to climate change and extreme weather risk, and then more specifically, residential flooding, flooding basements. 
So the, uh, which has now manifested itself in such a form that we have growth in the uninsurability of the housing market across Canada, from, from Halifax to Victoria, where people can no longer get insurance coverage for their homes for water in basements, whether it comes through sewer backup, water backing up through the sewer system, or overland flooding. So this is increasingly problematic across the country if you can't get insurance uh, coverage for your home. And the average cost of a flooded basement in Canada right now is about forty to $43,000. So if you have a flooded basement with $40,000 of damage, this all comes to prioritization in one second. So if you have a, a flooded basement, if you have thirty, forty thousand dollars $40,000 of, of damage in your basement, um, and you have no insurance coverage, this is particularly problematic because very often this is sewer water. Like this is really nasty stuff in your basement that if you flood on a Monday, you have to solve the problem by Wednesday of that week or the house is uninhabitable. And for a great many Canadians, they simply do not have that amount of money on hand to, to solve the problem. So, uh, and we have an increase in the degree to which people, the cap limits on insurance for flooded basements are now very much lower than they used to be. They're in the zone of ten to $20,000 maximum insurance coverage you can get if you can get still get insurance coverage uh, in stress zones, but there can be a cap limit. So you have some coverage, but a limited amount of coverage, and that's problematic. And then plus we see an increase in the uh, uh, home premium costs in the country for your home insurance, particularly related to flooding. Uh, premiums have gone up 20 to 25 percent in the last five years and over 50 percent of that increase is due to flooding. All of this to say um, the, the country has put uh, putting a great deal of effort into flood risk mitigation at the level of the individual house and the leadership on the file has uh, there's lots of people contributing to to means by which we mitigate flood risk at the level of the individual house but primarily the leadership has come from the area of property and casualty insurance because the Property and casualty insurance is more on the front lines of addressing climate change than any other industry by far. They're not the canary in the coal mine, they're, they're the ostrich in the coal mine. They're getting hit hard. And if they're getting hit hard, you're getting hit hard. So we now know exactly what to do, exactly what to do to a very, or at least to a very, very large extent to mitigate residential flood risk in the country. That's been worked out. Now what we're working on is the deployment of the best practices. And then secondary to that, we also now know exactly what to do to mitigate flood risk at the community level, uh, to prioritize areas that are at high risk of flooding, and then how to strategically deploy berms, diversion channels, holding ponds, cisterns, bioswales, permeable surfacing, naturalization of, of communities to mitigate flood risk. We know now also how to build new communities going forward with fundamental features and characteristics in place that make it such that the probability of that community being flooded out going forward is very, very low. So now we're deploying that. But the whole process prioritization has been on the fact that the, the big cost to the country was flooding in one form or another and then developing the solutions. And then secondary to that, the second greatest cost uh, by a substantial margin is forest fires, uh, affecting communities in forested zones and then the homes within those communities. And we now, through something called Fire Smart Canada, have an extremely good idea of, of how to deploy me measures, mechanisms, uh, to, to lower fire risk. So um, that's where the prioritization came from. And that's not to say that a, a, a multiplicity of other factors aren't also problematic. You know, be, between, for example, uh, Calgary and Edmonton, there's a hail zone where the frequency of hail storms that are extraordin extraordinarily costly has gone from three storms per year up to about 10 to 12 per year. So there's adaptation in the system to deal with hail. Um, so it depends on where you go in the country that the prioritization may be a little stronger. And the thing we haven't mentioned, I don't think we mentioned anyhow, was um, uh, in Canada's north is permafrost coming out of the ground, which is coming out rapidly, the ground thawing, and it's in impacting the structural integrity of buildings through Canada's north that they're literally falling over and runways are collapsing in northern communities, et cetera. This has to be a, a, a priority area of concern. So, I don't know if that answers your question. Financial burden to individuals and to the country as a whole, has what, with what determines our previous priority? To, to, to a large extent, the, the answer is yes. And a matter of fact, now, for example, for me personally, I spend less and less time with ministers of environment, public safety, and uh, natural resources and infrastructure. I mean, I still spend time with all of them. But my particular focus now is much more so on ministers of finance and treasury 
and, and I spend much, much more of my time now with the pension funds in the country, the institutional investors, and how to factor climate change into institutional money management. At the end of the day, it's people who sign checks that make decisions, and that's just the way it is. So we need to get the, the, the finance uh, people on board, at least in my position. I mean, we, we need everybody who's on board so far, but also we need to bring the capital markets into the equation. Uh, other, there's a hand up at the... Can I, can I bring... Can yeah, I please. So just an interesting observation that never once in all of how do we set priorities for habitation is a, a word of health. So what's, what's missing for me is, and we have work to do, is a quantifying what are the health impacts uh, and, and making that a part of the discussion about uh, prioritization as well, because yeah. it's all driven, what I heard from you is driven financially, but it start was at least financial impacts on the private sector. What about people in communities, right? Yeah. So it's just an observation. And, and by the way, I'm 100% in agreement with you. As a matter of fact, up till two years ago in this country, when you talk about climate change in the insurance industry, it was always a PNC problem, a property and casualty insurance issue. So we did a study just, we were talking about earlier, a little while ago, to show that the psychosocial or the mental health stress associated with flooding and residential flooding is astronomically high. And now what we're doing is looking at for people that experience flooding or flood zones, we're uh, quantifying uh, increases in uh, uh, prescriptions for medications to deal with psychosocial or mental health stress, number one. Uh, number two is uh, increase in counseling services for people who go through this experience. And number three is lost time from work which has now made the issue an issue for the life and health insurers who up until now paid zero, oh, I shouldn't say zero, very little attention to this topic, but now it's on their radar screen. And I'm, again, I, it, it might be quasi lamentable that it's always money at the root of it, but it still is the one that grabs attention up front, uh, I find. Uh, yeah. That couldn't have been a better introduction to my question. Um, I'm hearing themes of resilience, resistance, empathy, behavior change, perspective taking. Uh, my name is Dr. Susie McAfee. I am a, a clinical psychologist. I work full time in private practice, um, adjunct here at Dalhousie, but not really active except to show up to these things. My question for whoever, all of you, is um, have you partnered with any therapists? because I can't think of anyone better to contribute to the change processes that we're discussing today, um, because I'm certainly not gonna be able to treat all the people one-on-one -on -one that you're talking about, and in insurance companies and other institutions are also rapidly understanding that there are not enough psychologists to at all make an impact on the changes that we're seeing that impact people in the ways described. Um, I am group, a, a part of an international group, um, and they're doing some very exciting work that's a bit different than the one-on-one -on -one work. One of the tools that's been created is something called ProSocial. So I'm wondering if anybody's familiar with that tool, um, as it's a, it's a values-based tool that uses evolutionary principles to help small groups of people manage natural resources. And one of the, you know, the, the best examples is it was used effectively in Sierra Leone to help um, reduce the spread of disease by helping people flexibly adapt cultural values and traditions in full collaboration and participation with the community. So that's something, you know, that I have a lot of knowledge about, but all of, you know, your work is a little disjointed from that. And so I'm just wondering if it's already happened, maybe I'm not aware of it, but if it hasn't happened, I could see that in terms of kind of bringing forth, translating the work that's been done, that you need some therapists on the ground <laughs> that don't want to stay in their office like me. So. Obviously in Robert's zone here. So, I mean, thank you, really good point. In a very small way, uh, as part of our emergency, health system or emergency response planning, we do have mobilization of, uh, not necessarily psychologists, but mental health so workers, whether some psychologists, social workers, etc. So if we open up a shelter, for instance, so we, we do consider how do we provide people with training in mental health supports as part of the response piece. What I heard from you is a much broader role that we haven't really thought about, but thank you. I was going to say the same thing, really, that I haven't heard of this pro-social, uh, and I haven't partnered with any therapists, but it does seem to me that there is a... Um, the thing with therapy is you have to seek it out, right? Uh, and, <laughs> and
And so it's, I, I've tended, I, I, I'm borrowing quite a bit from psychology literature with some discomfort, right? You know, as, as with, whenever you're working outside um, your primary field. Um, and, and so I'm using it, I'm trying to use that in a way to almost pathologize, if you will, kind of climax thinking and, and what might kind of ease that particular kind of fallacious thinking. But the idea of actually pushing it out in a, in a more formalized way is a really nice idea. Thank you. Uh, where the mic? Go ahead. Hi. Thank you so much for all of your presentations. Et, oui, bonjour, Dr. Schwinner. Ça fait du bien de voir un peu de représentation du Nouveau-Brunswick. In policy, we're really good about using the word resilience. Uh, we're very bad at defining it. So could each of you, in two sentences, please define the term resilience and why it's important to the particular field you're working in? I'm happy to start by uh, actually saying, so at WWF, we, ac we just wrote a new strategic plan, and it had the word resilience all through it. And then we were like, what the frig does that mean? <laughs> and we took it out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we took resilience out of our strategic plan and instead talk about, um, we do talk about adaptability. We do talk about um, biodiversity. We talk about variety and thriving, all these other words that mean something a little more to us. So I can't give you a definition because I was already asked that this year and came up dry. So I would go, I'm going to go off the top of my head. I would just say it's building capacity at a, and I, I, I'm a public health physician, so I think about populations, building capacity within communities to withstand impacts uh, and minimize the, 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 both the short and long-term harms. So it's about flexibility, about strength, just you know, withstanding things and, 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 and staying strong. Hi, Bernard, my PhD student. <clears throat> the, I, I really think that the most frequently voiced definition is the capacity to bounce back. Um, I think it's really problematic in this context because the bouncing back is often interpreted in a way that um, we will rebuild, you know, we, we can do this, uh, to, to retreat is failure, to, and, and so I find that, res that definition of resilience often very problematic. Um, if you dig further into that literature, you see something more around the capacity to absorb shocks and maybe shift what you're doing, where you're doing it, um, maybe shift those things, but to continue to deliver the same quality of life, let's say, or the, the same uh, tools and, and, and services. Is that two sentences? I'm just trying to think. Did, did you have a second question in why that? Oh, why it's important. Yes, okay, I think I, I think I hit that. All right, I'll hand over. Yes, uh, thank you for this question. Uh, for me, when you ask this question, that just write, you know, some word. For me, it will be the capacity to go further, and not just you know for the immediate situation to go further, and not to capitulate, because generally you know the for me the people were asking me is if you what is your solution? I said the f best solution is to retreat. They and the people uh, told to me it's because you know we are jealous about about us because. We are living along the coast and you are living in mountain. I says, no, I am not jealous. But because when I am going along the coast, like, uh, what is the name of the village uh, 20 km, km from here? That's uh, Pegas Cove. When I am going, you know, along the ocean and I saw the big wave, I am seasick, you know. <laughs> And I would prefer to go f to live further. And when I want to see the, the shore, I will go there. But you know, the people have a tendency, you know, to uh, take just one point. And I, we encourage them to go collectively, collectively together. It's not discriminate, you know, the psychologists, you know. It's because we need the social worker and psychologists. But uh, to go further and to ask the government to, to, to go more. And just an anecdote here, you know, it, it just not to influence who for the vote, you know. Just in, nine, in 2006, a report was done 
644 pages, just a summary here, imagine. And uh, when at the end, uh, when will we, uh, the report, you know, we have to, to uh, send the report, you know, to, uh, it was in 2006, it was in December, December 2006. The original director from Environment Canada, who financed this study, you know, he told me the, uh, the morning, yesterday, I received a message from my deputy minister at Ottawa because the word climate change is on the report, I have not the right to speak. But I was just participate at the three chapter of this uh, big uh, research. I says I'm not prepared to talk to all, you know, but it just to show you, you know, to show to the audience here how, you know, the at that time, it was the ARPU government who came at the, uh, out at that time, you know, that the climate change, you know, it, they, they have to don't talk about that, you know. And uh, it was not revolutionary, this report. It was just, you know, the, to describe the situation. And it just to tell you, you know, how sensitive is a sensi uh, this, uh, this word, you know, for uh, some part of uh, people. That's it. And, uh, but I don't know if I answer to your question, but the, 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 short, the short answer is the ca capacity to go to the, uh, the uh, capacity to go further. How do we work with the group, with collective group, and the capacity to go further, and not just our own uh, village, our own uh, individual. And it's, it's difficult because uh, a guy told me, you know, two years ago, my mother is living, is 98 years old. She is living, you know, in the house, close to the shore. And we told her, don't stay there. She told to, the, to her uh, uh, family, if you, you bring me out of there, I will die, okay? I, I want to stay there. And if it's a, a, a dramatic, I will go out, I will go out, but I, will, I want to, st to stay there. My husband was there, my friend was there, I want to stay there. And it's not an easy uh, thing, you know, to convince them they have to retreat. Because, you know, it's the uh, ancestor and the, so on. You know, so. If, you know, just very quickly, even on this last point, something that's interesting, you know, uh, hopefully that's not something we have to move for. The, the, um, uh, with the Insurance Bureau of Canada, basically it's identified now that there's between about 500 and 800,000 homes in Canada that are in very high flood risk zones. So basically these can't be fixed. It, it would be, it's cost prohibitive to fix these homes. That, and there's going to be some emphasis placed on strategic retreat, like moving out of those areas, or you can stay there but you're on your own, period. You're not going to get bailout money from the federal government through disaster financial assistance arrangements and you're not going to get assistance from the province and you're not going to get insurance coverage so but the problem is going to be there's an awful lot of people they just they want to live there period and from a psychological a social perspective i think this is going to be very difficult by the way just very quickly on the health file another bit of good news in my opinion at least is the fact that Steve Lucas who was the Deputy Minister of Environment and Climate Change Canada up until just recently he's now gone over to be Deputy Minister at Health Canada so he's going to bring a whole wealth of expertise he he knows this file very very well uh, he'll bring a whole wealth of expertise to Health Canada on 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 climate change extreme weather risk anyhow next we lost the microphone a any any hand you see up but one is as good as the next yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, since I'm Ella Dodson, since you're talking about retreat, um, I'd like to suggest that in the context of talking about climate emergencies and adaptation, Canada and Nova Scotia need to start to address regional transportation. There are an awful lot of people who, when there's an emergency, don't have access to cars. You know, you have to be able to move people easily. This is something that can't be done at the local level. It has to actually be knocked up a, a notch. Um, and I think too often we're not taught, we assume that people are gonna have cars. We assume that it's the same form of transportation. 
And all you have to do is look internationally to realize that when there's an emergency, people get on any boat, even the stuff that's sinking, just to get out. And we have to plan for it. Yeah. Good. Another. By the way, we're not not responding. It's a good statement. Yeah. Uh, what is the adequacy of the uh, federal party's discussion of climate adaptation during the current federal campaign? Go ahead. Adaptation? Of yeah. Adaptation. Um, so a whole bunch of environmental NGOs, um, 14 of us, got together and defined what our priorities were for environment uh, back in June, and we met with all of, uh, we met with five of the six major parties, and we sent a survey to them in July, and they answered, and uh, so we have this beautiful scorecard of, um, you know, what their answers were on all these different environment priorities. On adaptation, the question, we had uh, a couple of questions relating to that. One was really about natural infrastructure, and uh, three, uh, three of the major parties actually have decent stuff in their platforms about natural infrastructure and adaptation through natural infrastructure, and I like to think it's because we've been pushing that uh, as an issue. Um, there is also a question in there about uh, transition to the green energy economy, economy, which is a bit of a different aspect of adaptation. And uh, three of the major parties uh, also agree that we need to do a just transition for workers. Anyone else want to? Uh, next. Go, sorry, go ahead. Hi there. Uh, for context, I'm a US Canada dual citizen I'm from South Florida. I've been there for about 10 years. And it kind of, my question kind of goes to the fact that we in this policy seminar right now have assumed that we're working within a system that has an understanding and believes in the fact that climate change is a reality. As policy professionals, how do we uh, try to work within a system that possibly doesn't have that viewpoint mm -hmm. and may actively work against our best interests as uh, people working in the policy field? That's a, it's a really tough question, and I think Please speak the, more into that. Yeah. I think the um, the discussion of what it was like under Harper also helps to kind of frame that for Canada. Not that I was doing that kind of work at this time, but it also seems like potentially a good opportunity for that kind of institutional entrepreneurship that uh, I was talking about earlier. Uh, using what you got, uh, being creative with it, finding ways to um, to do do adaptation with wetland policy, do adaptation with infrastructure investments, do, um, do that kind of work. And, and you know, it, it's, it's a pragmatic response because it doesn't help bring the conversation along, but it might be necessary. The other piece I would add that very challenging, but also um, language is important. So um, Every, I'm thinking about the things I presented on every time we have a forest fire, uh, a, a hurricane or stuff, we should be pushing and having, making sure that the language ties that in. That's an impact because of climate change. So making it very real that it's here today, it's not something abstract. And I think that's a way to engage people, which ultimately may then change some of the political perspective, but people are feeling the impacts today. And I would like to speak to not working with it as a policy person, but working in this context as Canadians, uh, as people who live here. So um, if you look at the climate policies of, I'll say, the four major national parties, uh, and three of them are, they're not identical, there's differences, but they're within this like bandwidth, right? So, so everybody talks about, we want this change to the tax code, we want this tax relief, this tax, but at the end of the day, no one's rewriting the Income Tax Act. And yet, we have a, a, a policy conversation happening in Canada right now where three of the parties have those little boutique things, like which one resonates with you, it doesn't really matter, it's all gonna be good. And then we have an extreme outlier. And that's really problematic uh, 
for, for us as a country. So how do we bring that outlier in? We're talking about climate change isn't a partisan issue. We're talking about climate change is like talking about tax breaks and tax reliefs where the bulk of the income tax act stays the same, but we can put our own stamp on it. That's on us. That is on us as civil society. That is on us working with that party, working with those people who have those beliefs and bringing them into the conversation. We need to ensure, whether it's working through businesses or working through um, industry or working through grassroots civil society movements, we need to have uh, to take an approach of less polarization to bring those outliers in. Uh, otherwise, it's always like, how can climate change be a partisan issue? And yet it is, and that's on us. I, I think we have time for one more question. Uh, oh, please, yes. It must be mine. My name is Peter Dunker. I'm uh, recently retired from the School for Resource and Environmental Studies here at Dell. And before my question, I have a confession. I did nod my head when Megan asked me uh, if a silver maple can transpire 220 gallons of water per day. I haven't got a foggy clue uh, <laughs> what the number is, but it doesn't matter what the number is. I still maintain the principle that uh, whatever your climate change question, trees are the answer. <laughs> Except for the salt marsh restoration, I'm willing to admit that we don't we're not, we're not looking at trees and salt marsh restoration. My question is about uh, research in this domain, and there are people in this room who will remember uh, that under the Cray-Chen government in 2000, the Canadian Climate Impacts and Adaptation Research Network was founded with a dozen or 14 offices across Canada, both regional and sectoral, and then under the subsequent government, uh, under Harper, that uh, program was punted, and uh, I would like to uh, suggest that um, the kind of research that Omar spoke about um, is the kind of research that uh, CCARN was really all about, uh, trying to get uh, going. And maybe Omar has a comment about whether being part of CCARN, which he was, uh, whether that actually gave him the inspiration to do participatory action research on these kinds of questions. Um, isn't it time that we, uh, maybe CCARN was before its time. And isn't it time that we brought back the concept of a national network of research, not only of un involving universities, but also governments and civic society um, uh, participants on climate change impacts and adaptation? Any final comments? Oh, yes, it's just... It have just, to go quick. We're just yes, it's just to say that I agree. And I have another anecdote, you know. In the same time, December 2000, 2006, two uh, women, from Halifax who were participate at the research at this research. It was economi economist uh, research, and they um, they uh, they were uh, they were they told us we want to work with two community small community you know to to know how is the cost you know the economic cost for the uh, uh, adaptation retreat and so on and. Uh, that it was the same thing. Now we have the order. It's not the priority of the government to work with community to help them to the to the local community. Because as they mentioned, you know, the mobilization at the local community it's easier than the, the, the wide, the large community. And we know that we have a lot, uh, uh, large amount of uh, local uh, small community at, uh, across the Atlantic, and we thought it would be very useful that the research be done, but because the upper government, it was cut. And uh, I agree with you, you know, the research with community and uh, uh, is very important. And uh, the uh, participatory research, I agree. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. So I'm going to close out very, very quickly just to say thank you to Robert, Megan, Kate, and Omar uh, for excellent uh, presentations. In my view, the, the work you're, you're doing here at Dalhousie is, is excellent in this forum. And also, I think you're in for a very pleasant surprise. I think uh, Deep Saney starts here in uh, January as the new, new president of the university. I know Deep extremely well, and uh, I've worked with him a lot. And he really understands this file very, very well. So you're going to have a very strong supporter with your, your new leadership coming on board. So thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Blair. Thanks so much for coming, everybody.